Good morning, everyone. Whether you're here in person or watching online, thank you for being part of our service here at Spirit Strap Baptist Church. Uh, if you're visiting us for the first time, you should have received a visitor card from an usher or a deacon. We'd be most thankful if you filled that out and got it back to us before you left today. Uh, just a few things I want to mention before we get started. Uh, first, thank you, Martha Jane, for, for making everything so pretty up here. Uh, it all looks so nice. I'd ask you to make me look prettier too, but that would run me too much money. Um, if you remember from our business meeting, uh, the sanctuary, if there's any any of you who would like one of the church pews, no, it's actually come apart in, in two sections. One's about five feet long, the other one's longer, so you can pick which section you want, uh, if you have a place for it, if you want one. Uh, you don't have to take it right now, uh, but we want to make sure that you get one if you want it. Also, uh, if you notice in your bulletin, we've changed the date of our trunk or treat to Halloween night. That's Saturday the 31st. Uh, it'll be right out uh, in the loop in the front in, in a drive through style, so we can make sure we're keeping social distancing and, and, and all following all the rules. Uh, we're asking folks to make individual bags of treats to give out rather than having everybody's hands in, in one bowl. Uh, please make an effort to come out uh, and take part uh, with that for our, for our church and our community. Uh, we're advertising it on the church sign, and, and Christie's made uh, extra signs to put along the road here leading up to the school. That'll be from 6 to 8 on Halloween night. And I think it's to be a lot of fun, so please plan uh, to come on out and, and take part. The men's group will meet this afternoon at 4.30 uh, down at the pavilion. If you'd like to take part in that, please see Jim Brooks. Uh, and also George Burrett uh, and a group of volunteers are heading down to Lake Charles, Louisiana for a couple weeks as part of uh, the disaster relief. Uh, those poor folks down in Lake Charles have really been through it this summer and fall with one hurricane after another. So please pray for them uh, and for George and his team. Sue, you have anything? Reminder to our ladies that we will meet this evening over Zoom at 4.30 and tomorrow morning at 10.30 here at the church. Our friend of the week is Miss Betty Evers. Please remember her. She recently had surgery and will be recuperating for, uh, for some time. So please remember her and Katie and family in your prayers and reach out to them as the Lord leads you to do that. We have a couple fellas up here along with uh, Kathy and Molly. Uh, going to share with you some good gospel music. I called them the Resurrection Boys 2.0. Back in the 90s, we had a group of men uh, who uh, comprised the Resurrection Boys way back then, and um, the only one that's left here with us is Harvey. So <laughs> Harvey is the uh, thread that continues it on, and we have uh, three other fellows this morning that are going to share uh, some songs we've sung before the choir and uh, they sort of claim them as their special song so they share with you a beautiful anthem gospel song that, that reminds us that one day uh, Jesus is coming for us and we're going to rise.
Just watch and pray, living day to day, always looking up to see. For He will appear, take away all fear, what rejoicing there will be. We shall rise. Deacons. There'll be a deacons meeting this Tuesday at seven o'clock. And thank you, Fred, for reminding me of that. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us such a beautiful morning to come together and worship <coughs> you. We thank you for giving us grace through the night that we're alive and healthy by your power alone. We thank you for providing all of our needs so that we lack no good thing. For this, we worship your holy name and ask that you accept our worship. We pray that you visit us mightily as we continue today's service. Let your presence be felt among us. We pray that those who are here do not leave the same as when they arrived, but they go knowing the depths of your love and your grace. Let us glorify your name through speech. And for it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I invite you to stand if you would like and join in singing our opening hymn uh, medley. Beautiful hymns, Come Thou Almighty King, the chorus of Glorify Thy Name, and two times through on Majesty. <laughs>
you follow along in your bulletins as we declare the word of God. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. We give you thanks and praise in your glorious name. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. In your hands are strength and power. To exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. One of the hardest things we suffer through as Christians is when we go to God over and over again for something that we desperately want, only to have him constantly answer no. It, it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts when God tells us no, even though our faith says God is good, that he loves us, and that he only wants the very best for us. 
we can understand that, that God knows much more than we know. That he sees much farther and deeper than we can see. My ways are not your ways, he says in Isaiah, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. We get that. And honestly, we want that in a God, don't we? Because deep down, we don't want a God that we can always understand. That's not the sort of God worthy of worship. Is a God whose ways are always clear and always make sense a God who is wiser than us? No. That's just a God who's only as smart and as knowing as we are. Is that a God we can give our souls to? A God we can really trust? It's a question that's, that's worth asking whenever our faith gets tested because it seems as if God doesn't hear our prayers when, when he either won't give us something that we want or take away something that we can't bear any longer. And that's something we all experience. We all go through this at some point, and many of us go through it many times in life. It's a crisis that even Jesus had to endure when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane for God to spare him from the suffering he knew was coming on the cross. He prayed so deeply that he sweated blood. And God, his father, his Abba, answered no. The sorrow we feel over those unanswered prayers can be overwhelming. It's one thing when we ask God for something but know deep down that maybe it's not the right thing. It's one thing when the things we pray and pray to either receive or be taken away would cause us harm if God said yes instead of no. But what about when the thing we're praying for is good, but God still seems to refuse? What about when, we, when what we want God to do will only be a blessing to us and to others, but he still seems silent? What do we do with our sorrow? And how do we use that sorrow to deepen our faith? That's what we're going to talk about today. And, and for help in dealing with this problem that we all face, we're going to look at the Old Testament and the story of Hannah, mother of the prophet Samuel. Hannah was, was married to a man named Elkanah. There was a time when they were both young, both in love, and their whole lives were laid out in front of them. Everything had been planned out and imagined in the most perfect way, just like we all start our lives. But as the years went on, a problem began to grow that neither of them could face. And so it kept growing and growing until it became a shadow that was cast over Hannah's life. Let's read that story now. 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 20. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Anna was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remember her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And this is God's word. 
I can't tell you how many times in my life that I've turned to this story for help. That, that's why I love the Old Testament. It's filled with people from a completely different time and a completely different culture, but people who still suffer and overcome completely human problems. And here's one that we can all recognize. Here's a woman that life has left sorrowful, and yet Hannah doesn't surrender. She's broken when we meet her, but she's healed when we leave her. And if there's a more rewarding life than that, I don't know what it is. But how does Hannah do it? We're going to look at three steps. What Hannah's sorrow is, what Hannah does with that sorrow, and how that sorrow is transformed as a result. First, what's the nature of Hannah's sorrow? What's the real cause of her problem? We see in these verses two reasons why she's so unhappy. First, she's in a polygamous marriage. Uh, Hannah isn't Elkanah's only wife. She's sharing her husband with another woman named Penina. Now, this is, this is something that, that atheists love to point out when it comes to the Bible. They say, here's what you say is God's word, but it's talking about people having more than one spouse. And isn't that terrible? Isn't that proof that book is just a bunch of old and outdated words that don't apply to the modern world? Because we all know polygamy is wrong, right? It's terrible. You know, polygamy is against the law. But remember two things here. One is that the Bible's always honest. It never shies away from what people did and, and what the culture thought was okay at that time. That's why all through the Old Testament, you see men with many wives. But here's what critics of the Bible often miss. In every place where polygamy is talked about in the Old Testament, there's trouble. We see it with Solomon and his wives, wives and David and his wives. You see it with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, Jacob with Rachel and Leah. And now we see it with Elkanah, Penina, and Hannah, because they're miserable. And none of them are more miserable than Hannah. We can tell a lot about who these three people are by their name. The Hebrews didn't just name their children anything. A name carried meaning. Hebrew men were usually named for something religious. That's why Elkanah's name means God is owner. But the Hebrew women were named for more for their inner qualities, something inside them that shined out above all the rest. Hannah's name means grace or gracious. She, she was a woman who had a natural kindness to her and the grace of God. Panina, on the other hand, means a cornered gem, a precious jewel, like a ruby or a pearl. Panina had the looks, you see. She was beautiful. And you begin to see the problem here, right? But here's the biggest problem, and here's why Elkanah ended up with two wives in the first place. Hannah couldn't have children. And worse, look at the end of verse 5. Not only was Hannah barren, God was the one who had closed her womb. You have to understand how important it was for women at that time to have children. The Hebrews considered having children the greatest cultural good. The more children you had, the better things were for you economically. You depended on your children to run the family business, whether it was farming or a trade or anything else. And the more children you had, the bigger and the better your business could be. That meant security for your future, because when you got old, your children could provide for you in the same way that you once provided for them. Having children was also good for the nation as a whole because it meant more workers and that meant a stronger national economy and more soldiers to defend Israel against its enemies in a, in a dangerous world. So if you were a woman at that time, your job was to have babies. It was the very best thing you could do for your family, for yourself, for your society, for your country. If you were a woman and you had babies, you were a hero. If you didn't, or you couldn't, you were an absolute failure. That's something that we can't really understand today. But the point for us isn't that Hannah couldn't have children. The point is that every culture and every time puts an enormous amount of pressure on its people to live up to society's expectations. Maybe in our culture we don't need to have children to feel like we're succeeding, that we're fitting in. But don't we feel like we need more money? Don't we feel pressured to have shiny things, looks, accomplishments? 
Every culture, no matter when or where it is, has expectations that only a few people will ever really meet. But that doesn't stop that culture from looking at you and saying, you're not rich enough, you haven't done enough, you're not good enough, you're not measuring up. Every culture tries to make you fit. And Hannah didn't fit. Panina did. She had the looks and the kids. She had everything on the surface except her husband's love. If you look at verse 8, you'll see that Elkanah's heart belonged to Hannah alone. So here's the problem in a nutshell. Panina had the children but not the love. Hannah had the love but not the children. So nobody was happy. But if we dig deeper, you'll see that Hannah's real sorrow wasn't that she couldn't have children. It was that she wanted a child so that she could feel valued. Valued by herself, by her husband, and by her society. She can't accomplish this one thing she wants out of life. Hannah's worse than stuck. She's stuck in a pit. She's down in the darkness, and there's no way out for her. That's her sorrow. So now what does Hannah do with that sorrow? The setting for the scripture is in the town of Shiloh. And Shiloh is where the tabernacle was. Every year, Elkanah would take his entire family to Shiloh to worship at the tabernacle. And there would be a fellowship meal that went along with bringing an offering to God. Just a huge meal, celebration. Verse 5 tells us that Elkanah gave a double portion to Hannah because he loved her. That must have upset Penina, right? But then according to verse 4, Penina had all of her sons and daughters there. She'd given birth many times, which had been like a knife through Hannah's heart. This was a hard time for Hannah, these trips to the tabernacle. And Penina only made things worse because verse 7 says that she would provoke Hannah. The Hebrew word there for provoke means to be angry and to grieve. Penina's being a bully, in other words. All of this comes to a head during this particular fellowship meal. This is where Hannah reaches a point where she just can't handle things anymore. But in order to get a good handle on what Hannah does, it's important for us to talk about what she doesn't do. All through this story, all through Hannah's adult life, she's hearing two voices. There's the voice of Penina that represents what the culture says Hannah should be and how she's a failure. Then there's the voice of her husband, of Elkanah, saying that as long as he loves her the most, everything should be fine. Each of those voices is saying to her, here's how you find a happy life. One is to have children, the other is to depend on your husband's love. But Hannah's not giving in to either one of those voices. As sorrowful as she is, she still knows that anything she builds her life on other than God is going to fail. That's why she refuses to build her life on what the world says she should be, and she refuses to build her life on her husband's love. So that's what Hannah doesn't do. Now let's look at what she does. There's a tiny phrase tucked away at the beginning of verse 9 that's easy to miss, but it means everything. After they'd eaten and drunk, what happened? Two words, Hannah rose. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but in the Hebrew, it's <clears throat> extremely important. It's an expression. You know how we say, somebody put their foot down? That's what this means. Hannah stood up. She took charge. She decided she was going to do something and wasn't going to just let life happen to her anymore. She can't enjoy this feast, not with Panina and all those children there. Hannah did that out of duty but she can't do it anymore. She's had enough. So there's only so much polite smiling and fake laughing she can do before all of that sorrow finally overcomes her. So we're all adults here, and, and we all know that part of being an adult is putting on a mask that keeps what we're really feeling buried deep down so we can get on with the business of living life. Suck it up, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Deal with it. Grow up. The problem with that is that we can't suck it up for long. Sooner or later, all of that grief and disappointment and frustration inside of us has to come out. We can't keep those things bottled up 
for long. They leak out, and if we're not careful, they leak out over the people we love most. If we're not careful, they can leak out and lead us to sin. Hannah can't wear that mask anymore. She's finished. So she stands. She's going to trade the fake sort of worship of having this meal with the real worship of going to the temple to face God and all of her brokenness. Hannah wants to do something radical. So what does she do? She prays. And here's where we get to the real turning point of Hannah's life. Here's where all that sorrow she's carried for years finally gets laid to rest. It's not simply that Hannah, pay, Hannah prays, it's how she prays. Look at verse 10. How does Hannah pray? She was deeply distressed and prayed bitterly because of her barrenness, because of her pain, because the one thing she wanted in life, the one thing that would make her life worth something, the one thing she desired had been kept from her for years. Hannah's life was bitter without children. She had no pleasure. She had no peace. Now listen, because this is important. What, here's what happens so often. Something in our lives affects us deeply. We need to either get something from God or we need God to take something away from us. And we do what we should with that need. We do as good Christians do. We take that need right to God. But God says no. So we ask again. And he says no again. And on it goes. And on and on. Sometimes for years. How many times do you think Hannah prayed for a son before this day? How many other tears do you think she shed to God over this problem? Or let me put it a different way. How many prayers have you sent to God for something that you still don't have? Something you need. Something you want with all your heart. Something that's good and can only be a blessing. You see, too many people look at this story and say it's just about a woman who couldn't have a child. But that's not true. Hannah is all of us. Maybe not all of us are barren in the way that she was, but all of us experience times in our lives when our lives feel barren. Times when nothing seems to be born out of our work or our service or our relationships. Times when we feel like we don't measure up. Times when we're afraid that we don't matter at all. And what can happen after all those times of going to God and either hearing him say no or hearing only silence. We can say, well, if you don't want anything to do with me, God, then I don't want anything to do with you. We stop walking forward in our faith because we don't understand what God's doing. And then we drift away from our faith because we start doubting God's love. And then finally we walk away because we start thinking that maybe he was never there at all. Anna doesn't do that. She puts herself right in the position to obtain the blessing she's always wanted, not by hiding her feelings from God, but by pouring them out to God. All of that bitterness, every bit of that sorrow, every tear she had left poured out to God. She didn't run away from him. She ran as fast and as hard as she could toward him. So much so that Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. She tells Eli in verses 15 and 16 that she's been pouring out her soul to the Lord. Not just her heart, but her soul. And that she's been speaking out of her great anxiety and vexation. You see, God was all Hannah had. He was all Hannah ever had. So she poured out everything. She held nothing back. Hannah knew the one thing that mattered here. And it's the last words of verse 5. God had closed her womb. And if God had closed it, then only God could open it up again. That's how Hannah got to a place where she could receive her blessing. But how did she actually get it? Look at verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. First, notice here that Hannah doesn't ask for many children. Benina has many children, but Hannah only asks for a son. One. 
And notice too, how many times in verse 11 that Hannah calls herself God's servant. She's pouring out her heart and asking for this one thing, but also reminding herself that she is God's servant first. And whatever God wants, even if it's no, one more time, won't affect the most important thing in her life, which is her relationship with her Lord. So we've seen how we're supposed to act when God says no. We need to keep going to him and never hide. And we've seen how we're supposed to look at our lives as Christians. We're God's servants first. That means always seeking his will instead of our own and always accepting whatever he brings into our lives. And that's not as hard as it sounds. When we're servants to the world or to other people, we can live in misery. But what did Jesus say about being his servant? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And now we see how we're supposed to think about all these things we feel like we can't live without. The things we want most of all in life. And it's right there at the end of verse 11. Hannah prays that if God gives her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Now, what does that mean? There were men called Levites uh, whose only job was to help the priests in and around the tabernacle. That was their calling. That was their trade, their career. They lived near or in the tabernacle and took care of everything. So if you were born into that tribe, that was your job. The Levites couldn't own land. They couldn't have farms or businesses. They, their entire lives revolved around service to God. A Nazarite was a voluntary Levite, someone who wasn't born into the Levite tribe, but still did Levite work. And the sign that you were a Nazarite was that your hair was never cut. And Hannah says to God, if you give me a son, I'll make him a Nazarite. She makes a promise. The first part of verse 11 says she vowed a vow. And that promise was this. Give me a son, God, and I will give that son right back to you. Not just for a few years, but for his entire life. So now what becomes of, of Hannah's sorrow after this? Look at the end of verse 18. Then the woman, meaning Hannah, went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. What's, what's happened here? It's a change, no, no doubt about that. Hannah has just on the, undergone a huge change in her life, but most importantly in her heart. But what is that change and what's behind it? On the surface, it looks like Hannah's bargaining with God, doesn't it? But let's look at that a minute. If Hannah was bargaining with God, she would have started with the prayer and then gotten pregnant, and then found peace, right? But that's not what happened. What happened was the prayer, and then the peace, and then the pregnancy. And when she says that she'll make the child a Nazarite, what's Hannah doing? When it, when it came to a woman of that time and that place, what were the social benefits of, of and emotional benefits of having children that we talked about? Having a child would make a woman fit in, right? But if God gives Hannah what she's asking for, she still won't fit in because her son would have to live and work at the tabernacle. A son was supposed to learn his father's trade, but Hannah's son wouldn't do that. Again, because he'd be an Azurite. He couldn't learn Elkanah's trade. He couldn't inherit land. A son would fill a woman's life with richness and affection, but Hannah wouldn't have that either because her son wouldn't live with her. Here's Hannah's prayer, and, and, and here's the change that finally happened in her heart. She's saying, Lord, all my life, I've wanted to have a child for me, but now I want to have a child for you. You see, she's redirecting her desire for a son. For years, it was all about her. Now it's all about her God. She's going to give the things she wants most to him. Give me what I want, she says, and I'll give it right back to you, Lord, because I trust you. Because for, for as much as I want a son, I want you more. And that prayer, the prayer that pours out our wants and needs and desires before God, while knowing that God is always first, that God is all that matters, that is the kind of prayer that moves mountains. That is the prayer that makes miracles happen. 
Because that is the kind of prayer that goes beyond just pouring out our troubles. It's taking those troubles and making them into an offering for God. It's knowing that whatever we truly give to God will be repaid in a way that blesses us beyond anything we can understand. It's handing what we cherish the most over to him with a faith that says, I know you'll take care of this, God, and no matter what you answer, I know it will be for my peace and my joy. If Hannah was asking for a son for herself, the peace she had after her prayer wouldn't have been possible. But if she's asking for a child for God, that peace was the only thing she could feel. And God said, okay. That was the heart of Hannah's prayer. The one thing she cherished most was to be a mother. And a son would make her a mother. And so the only person who could keep safe what Hannah cherished was God. Not her, but him. Because Hannah knew God would love her and her child more than she could ever love anyone or anything herself. If you want to keep safe, those things that you love most in life, the very worst thing you can do is keep them to yourself. Give them over to God. He can do what you can't. I've heard people say that prayer isn't about asking for God to change things, but asking him to change us. And I've heard that prayer isn't about looking for a fix to our circumstances, but fixing us to better endure our circumstances. And honestly, I don't know how a lot of that works. But I do know this. Hannah didn't think about any of that on the day she stood up and went to the tabernacle. She just emptied out her heart and gave everything to God, and that's what real prayer is. That's all God wants us to do. Give it all to him. And then turn around and give it all to him again. And then let him handle it. Trusting that he will. Whatever it is. I know this too, but there's something about the makeup of this world and how God fashioned things that gives us part of the responsibility for how life turns out. Not just for us, but for everybody. We're, we're not supposed to just sit on the sidelines. We have a say in how things happen. That's why prayer is so important. Even when it feels like God isn't there, he is. Even when life feels barren, he's planting seeds. And even when it feels like nothing at all is happening, everything is happening just beyond our sight. Let's pray. Father, every day and every moment, we come to you with things we want, things we need, things we think we could never do without. You are such a gracious God, such a loving God, but more than that, you are a wise God. You know not only those things we need and want, but you know when and whether you should give those things to us. Help us, Father, to understand that all we truly need is you. All those things we desire, all those things we think will make us whole, cannot compare to your presence in our lives and the love you have for us. Give us hearts that want only you. Give us minds that understand and seek out your will. Help us each day to draw closer to you, Father just as you always draw closer to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand once again and we'll sing our closing hymn this morning. Time of response and invitation to you. I surrender all.
Now let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you.